you Shoshana for moderating the uh, storytelling session and thank you Sandra for grounding us in what this conference is about, changing systems, changing lives. You started us out with the changing lives part, helping us understand the impact of homelessness on human animal lives. And now I'd like to move us into our next session, which is about the changing systems part. Health and homelessness are inextricably linked. An acute behavioral health crisis or any long-term disabling condition may lead to homelessness and homelessness itself can exacerbate chronic mental health and medical conditions. According to the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, people living in shelters are more than twice as likely to have a disability compared to the general population. Our plenary, a colienza, how radical hospitality can transform our American mental health system will challenge us to reimagine the broken system we have now that leads to people suffering on our streets. We witness this ourselves and we hear about this from grieving family members who are at wit's end trying to help their loved ones. And we hear the shocking statistics that our jails have become de facto mental health treatment facilities. Against this background, there's a North Star of Hope that is worth paying attention to, Trieste, Italy. Recognized by the World Health Organization as a global best practice for community-based mental health care, in this city that cares, people are included in civic life, are not viewed as someone with a diagnosis, and are afforded opportunities to pursue meaning, purpose, and hang on to their dreams. In this session, we will talk about how these Italian principles, grounded in a colienza, or radical hospitality, are transferable even into an American cultural context. And yes, the therapeutic benefits of pets are a thing. To help me moderate this session, I'd like to invite one of My Dog is My Home's founding board members and Corporation for Supportive Housing Senior Program Manager, Anne English, to join me. Thanks so much, Christine. It's great to be here. Um, I'm really excited for this session. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce everyone to our plenary speaker, Carrie Morrison. Um, Carrie is the founder and project director for Heart Forward LA. She responded to this calling in 2019 after spending 22 years leading business improvement districts in Hollywood during a time of unparalleled community revitalization and economic growth. And in 2016, as a Stanton fellow, she was searching for a better way to help the most severely mentally ill people that were left to languish on our streets. And she found her way to Trieste, Italy. Uh, it's a city recognized by the World Health Organization as a model system for providing community-based mental health care. Working in collaboration with county officials, she helped to build a coalition in LA County committed to bringing these global best practices to a mental health pilot in Hollywood. And prior to the pandemic received funding support from the state's Mental Health Services Act. Carrie is an active a member of the homeless policy and nonprofit work in Los Angeles. She's served as a mayoral appointee to the LA Homeless Services Authority. She currently serves on the HHH Citizens Oversight Committee. She holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Santa Clara University and a master's degree in public administration from USC. She's also a graduate of CORO, uh, Southern California's fellowship program in public affairs. And she writes about the Trieste model on her website, www.acolienza.us. And we'll drop that in the chat. On a personal note, I've known Carrie for some time and I was actually around when she began leaning into the homelessness issue in Hollywood and started Hollywood Forward. Uh, I've seen over the years, uh, persistent dedication from her to pursuing solutions and learning about the challenges and addressing them for our most vulnerable folks in Los Angeles. So I'm really excited to be here. Thanks, thanks so much for being with us, Carrie. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Christine. Hello, everybody. Wow, 271 people. What a big room. Everyone wave. <laughs> uh, this is one, one of the good things about Zoom. We can get everybody uh, together uh, to capture this important information. So a few good things have come out of the pandemic, like less than five. This would be one of them. Um, 
Anyways, I'm so delighted to be here. You know, when Christine first reached out to me, I said, I don't really do anything in the world of pets, right? And, and you know, like what, I don't know how this would be relevant. Uh, but the more I've been kind of thinking about speaking with you today, I realize I actually, there's a lot I could learn from you as well. And I look forward to our Q&A um, because uh, pets really do factor into um recovery and uh, just feeling less anxious and kind of um, connected in so many ways. I mean, certainly I feel that way about my own pet. And so it's caused me to reflect about how our American system is so cautious and so risk adverse in this space. And I'm going to share some ideas at the end of <clears throat> my presentation where I've run into some roadblocks in this space. And I'm I'm hoping you know, there might be some help. But let me let me let me tell this story a little bit more because um I used to feel very insecure that I was walking into the mental health space. I'm not a clinician. You heard I have a political science degree. I've managed a business improvement district. I'm an expert in, you know, picking up trash and trimming trees. But um the homelessness problem in 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 our community was pretty overwhelming. And it it, it really, is, as Anne said, caused me to wander into it. So now I, I no longer make apologies for the fact that I don't have a clinical background, but I feel like I'm an expert on mental health system change because uh, the system change we're looking for is not clinical. It's more social community or what they would call psychosocial. Um, so I do have a little PowerPoint, of course, and let me just... Um, share some images and to um, kind of wet everyone's whistle here. Can someone give me a nod? Does this show? Okay, cool. Um, so let's get started here. Let me see how I move this forward. So um, Anne might remember this person. Yes, she does. Okay. Tori was my uh, portal into this. Uh, I call it the Tori story or trillion dollar Tory, you've heard of million dollar Murray. Um, I was super afraid of this guy. He was, uh, he had been homeless on the walk of fame for about six or eight months, pretty much sitting on the same bus bench, maybe walking a block in either direction. And I just was mystified as to how it was that the system would not help him, right? How, how can this be? And we were making progress. Uh, as Anne will recall, we had a coalition called Hollywood Forward, and we were making progress in bringing housing opportunities into Hollywood. But for people like Tori, there was just um, very little opportunities to help him. He obviously is seriously mentally ill, schizophrenia. And this was the day we took him to get a shower, which was about a three month um, strategy to convince him to go with us in a in a van to PATH where Ann was working, people assisting the homeless. And um, I, I don't wanna use the word bribe, let's just say incentivize with cigarettes and his favorite hamburger and a 100% commitment that we would bring him back to that same corner after he had taken a shower and, and gotten some clean clothes. The Tory story, I could I could talk for two hours about this. The bottom line is that he was my portal into the mental health system because he is still in my life. He lives in a board and care right now in Hollywood. This is him about two years ago in another board and care. Um, he, I have experienced the jail with him, hospitalization, conservatorship. He fathered a child in an IMD. Uh, he's been on board and cares, and he he's been my kind of. Um, personal uh, witness to the journey of our broken mental health system. And just as a comparison, this is a, a blog I wrote um, about him. And you can see on the left, this is the condition he was in on the Walk of Fame, you know, in need of the shower. And this was him eight months later as um, the community, you know, Anne and others and Get Love and others that she will remember, encircled him, gained trust with him, built rapport with him. He was hospitalized. He was treated. He was fed. He was bathed. And you could see the absolute transformation. And he, we were able to figure out his family, who he was, where he went to school. Um, and so that started my journey that like, how is it that we allow people to just die on our public streets. 
Um, so, you know, this was kind of the the uh, juxtaposition I was involved with. This is the Walk of Fame, you know, arguably the most famous tourist destination in Los Angeles. And here are people living in just destitute um, uh, uh, conditions in the middle of Hollywood. And then meanwhile, you could see the cranes in the air. We were bringing back the Academy Awards and W Hotel and, you know, theaters were being renovated. The Lion King came back, uh, glamorous apartments, nightclubs. But this juxtaposition was really troubling to me. And so um, in 2016, I was awarded what's called a, a Stanton Fellowship, as Anne um, uh, mentioned, it is a wonderful opportunity by the um, the Durfee Foundation in Los Angeles. They, they choose five or six people every two years, and you're given a, a grant award, and they expect you to spend three months away from your job over two years in order to... Um, explore or kind of study an inquiry. You know, if you had a, if you had two years to study something that could improve the quality of life in Los Angeles, what would that be? And my inquiry was, why is it so hard to help the most seriously mentally ill people get off the streets of Los Angeles? Why is it so hard? And um, the reason I have this rubber band ball here is because when I was um, awarded the fellowship, uh, they had us come to an award ceremony and you had three minutes to describe what your inquiry was. I'm like, how am I going to, I've already spent 10 minutes talking to you on, uh, uh, how am I going to, how am I going to distill this into three minutes? And on my way there, I stopped at Staples and I picked up a rubber band ball and I held it up and I said, you know what? There is a person inside this rubber band ball and every one of these rubber bands represent all of the constrictions, restrictions, legal requirements, privacy laws, you know, HIPAA, uh, risk aversion strategies that we have encapsulated around the human being in the middle of this ball, and we cannot get to the human being. I want to find out how do we, how do we either rip those off or, you know, what, what, what's, what's necessary. So that was my metaphor. And it, it, it continued to, to be a, a good, good guiding metaphor for me. And so for the first year, I spent most of the year um, just trying to read and study why it was that the American mental health system fell off the rails. And I did a deep dive on that. And that is a whole other talk. So, you know, I can give you some resources if you want to understand that. And I've done some writing about it. And I also went throughout the United States looking at different systems. I went to New York, went to Denver, went to Miami, but I really pretty much found that nobody was doing it any better in the United States. So this appears to be a US problem, not an LA problem or a California problem. It's a, it's a national problem grounded in basically how we built or actually unbuilt mental health systems dating back to the sixties and the seventies. So in, as I was like planning my second year of, of the fellowship, I had people, a few people say, you really should go to Trieste, Italy. Like Trieste, I've never even heard of it. What, what, what's there? What's, what's worth seeing there? And as you can see, Trieste is, is kind of way up in the corner, right near Slovenia, 15 miles south of Slovenia. It doesn't even really feel like Italy. And in fact, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, you can't even get good pasta there. So <laughs> it's more, the food is very different. But it is kind of protected. And in that city has been a remarkable, like I would call Petri dish or an ecosystem that started about 40 years ago to actually build a community-based mental health system. And the, the visionary behind this system is a man by the name of Franco Basaglia. And he was a psychiatrist. Um, he had uh, he had a deep um, sense of um, anger and angst about how people were treated in the asylums in Italy as, as they were in the United States and elsewhere. That was kind of a common theme in the 40s, 50s and 60s. And but he had some very, very novel and innovative ways to approach this. Um, which were completely counterintuitive to anything that you would expect from a psychiatrist in an institutional setting. I will tell you that if there's a, if you want to read about him, there's a wonderful book that was written in 2017, The Man Who Closed the Asylums. 
And um, he really uh, captures the evolution of Franco Basaglia, how Franco Basaglia uh, was what, what inspired him and then how he actually pulled this off. And you can see in this picture here that he had all of these young psychiatrists, this would probably be in the late 60s, he, he became just kind of like a, a gravitational pull for psychiatrists that wanted to be part of a new movement. And this picture gives me hope because I'm really hoping that it's the young psychiatrists in America today who will start to recognize that our system is so um, uh, dysfunctional that they would be open uh, themselves to exploring a new way forward. So what happened was that, you know, I went, let me, in fact, I'll just jump to this next picture. I went to, um, I went to Italy in 2017 and I, I spent one full day there touring the system with this young man, Dr. Um, Tommaso Bonavigo, and he showed me their system. Um, here we are at one of their community mental health centers. And um, one of the things that blew me away, if any of you know anything about just your own system in your own city, um, in a city of 230,000 people, uh, which is pretty big, like Modesto or Merced, they had six psych beds for the whole city in an unlocked ward where they don't use restraints. So just wrap your mind around that. By no restraints, that means no handcuffs, no um, six point restraints on a bed. You could, the door is unlocked, you could leave six beds for a city of 230,000. So what does that tell you? That tells you that they do everything possible to prevent a person from ending up in the hospital, which means you start working way early on in a person's crisis or even, even as a young person, because ending up in the hospital is, is a sign of failure. And, and um, <laughs> I, I remember at the end of this day, and there are so many remarkable things about what I saw that day, and by the way, that's, he's a doctor. He doesn't look like a doctor, right? This is like, this is part of the thing that you get from the get-go. Not, nothing looks clinical, nothing looks institutional. But I remember I started crying at the end of this day, this tour with him, and he was so flummoxed, like, what, what's going on? And I said, you know what? I almost wish I hadn't seen this because I'm going to come back to LA. I am going to tell people I've seen the promised land and I have no credibility. I am... I'm a, I run a business improvement district. I, it's just, it would have been better had I not seen this. What am I going to do with this? And they came back and um, about a month later, they announced an international conference in Trieste. They, they used to do these every two years. And so I thought, well, I'll use some of my fellowship money to bring a bunch of people back from LA to see it because like, I'll bring some clinical people because maybe I was imagining things and, and, but let me bring them back. So I used some of my grant funds and I assembled this group you see on the left, the November group, and that included the head of the Department of Mental Health for LA County. It included the chief judge for the mental health court. It included um, people from the LA Sheriff's Department and the LA Police Department who do what they call mental evaluation, it included someone from the LA County Jail, the largest mental institution in the country, the district attorney sent her mental health deputy. I had someone from LASA, NAMI, and I called everyone back to Italy with me and said, okay, what do y'all think? And everyone was like blown away. So I was like, okay, good. It wasn't my imagination. And as a result um, of that, uh, that trip, we spent about a year working in LA to imagine a new ecosystem um, that if we could secure state funding uh, from, for a pilot, what would that look like to be inspired by the, by the values in Trieste? Um, I'll just, you know, I'm not going to go through all these pictures, but I just want to point out that I've been there five times and I, including in March, 2019, when I left my job running the bid, told them to find my replacement. I have got to, I've got to keep telling this story. And I spent a month living there to kind of understand what is the secret sauce, um, that helps the system operate. So let me go backwards here for a minute. Um, so this was the group that went, and as you can see, once you've seen Trieste, you cannot pretend it doesn't exist. It just haunts you in a, in a positive way. And so what is it that makes it so different? There's kind of like five basic elements. First of all, 
social recovery. And, and the belief is that human connection is therapeutic. You know, medication is therapeutic too. Does not people still take medication for their illness, but human connection is therapeutic. And it actually can be more impactful than um, psychiatric interventions. Kinship, family, friends, and pets. And this, this has been in here, my PowerPoint for years. Pets matter because I saw pets everywhere in Italy. Purposeful life. This is one of the most um, exciting things, and it's it's what we deprive people of in the United States. You have a human right to pursue meaning in life that comes from work, creativity, and the opportunity to learn. So they believe that people have a right to wake up in the morning to a sense of purpose to their day. Like I woke up this morning, my purpose today was to spend time with you, you know, and that gave a reason to get out of bed. But if we deprive people of purpose, we deprive them of a really important recovery um, element. Radical hospitality, and everyone's struggling with the word. The word is accoyenza, accoyenza. Uh, I actually have a way you can pronounce it on my blog, accoyenza. And my husband said, are you sure you want to call it accoyenza? And I said, yes, because if we just say hospitality, we have an American view of hospitality that I think is more like there's a, a mint on your pillow at the Marriott. That That's American hospitality. But accoyenza is like a radical hospitality. Uh, it means that you are welcome here and you are safe and they mean it. You are seen. We hear you. You are loved. And as human beings, we are equal. There is a lack of power dynamics in the Trieste system that is breathtaking. Um, you know, just because I have a PhD or I have a master's in social work, it does not make me any better than you. We are equal human beings. System accountability. This is a huge one. You know, in the American system, we lose track of people all the time by design. Uh, the people you see wandering the street right now, they might have had a case manager two years ago, but there was a warm handoff maybe to another agency or they got out of jail and nobody met them. And there is no sense of accountability for the people who are in our mental health system. So in the Italian system, you are not left to figure out the system alone. They catch you. Uh, you will be served by familiar faces, by a, by a team approach, so that if one of your members leaves or goes back to school or moves out of town, there's at least a familiar face that will stay connected to you, similar to like what I've done with Tori all these years now, which gosh, has been, has it been 20 years? Wow. Um, so he knows he can call me, even though he's had a whole plethora of case managers over, over the years. And then finally, whole person care. You are not your diagnosis. We will support you in your, in your life plans and your daily needs. And what that means is that in the Italian system, Instead of like keeping what you would call clinical notes about a person, they track the person's life history. You know, tell us where did you go to school? What do you like? What did you like to study in school? And they also focus on a person's life aspirations, their goals. And the system is intended to help the person meet those goals. Absolutely, we do not do that in the American system. So the dichotomy with just these word clouds, you'll hear like, the word risk, we're going to talk about that in a moment, especially let's just like even apply with pets. Oh, there's just too much risk to have a dog in this facility or there's a risk, there's a risk, there's a risk, there's a risk. Um, there's audits, there's facilities, there's payments, there's medical necessity, HIPAA. HIPAA is a Teflon force field that prevents people, professionals in the system from even talking to you about the person. I can't even get to Tori's psychiatrist. He will not talk to me, even though I'm the only person on the planet Earth that has a consistent relationship with them because they're worried about HIPAA. Whereas in the, in the Italian system, these are the words that describe it. Inclusion, family, community, hospitality, kinship, purpose, recovery completely could not be more opposite, which is why you can't just come home and, and just think, well, we can never do that because we could. So um, moving forward after that, spending that year in our little skunk works, imagining what, you know, we, we, we kind of did whiteboard sessions like this is how it works right now in, in LA, you know, and this is how it could work if we applied these uh, Italian principles that I just showed you those five um, a proposal was submitted to the state of California, it's the Mental Health Oversight and Accountability Committee, because in California, 
we have what's referred to as Prop 63 funds, the millionaire's ta tax, and it funds innovation programs. So in this case, the state of California agreed to fund a five-year pilot in Hollywood, $116 million inspired by the Trieste model. Okay, so then what happened? This, I love this little image. <laughs> okay, so the big monkey wrench, you know, kind of like came crashing down and, and kind of slowed, slowed things down and, and changed a few things, uh, which I won't belabor uh, everything that changed and things are starting to ramp back up about the pilot. But I, I went on a pandemic pivot. I was like, okay, I was, you know, all ready to help get this thing going and start it and support it. And now, you know, just like the rest of you, I'm in my backyard, you know, counting out sheets of toilet paper, wondering, okay, what do I do to keep working on these ideas that I believe in? So I had a three-part pivot. Pan I call it my pandemic pivot. One was to work on this blog, Acquienza. And that's so it's Acquienza. Everybody say it, Acquienza. <laughs> um, and that's my personal blog. And it started when I went to Italy for those um, that month. And I, I wrote about how I was experiencing their secret sauce there. And then I just continued to, to keep writing. So that's a good place to kind of like hang out and hear my thoughts about how our system differs from the Italian system. The second thing I did is I started a podcast like 88 million other people in the world, but I have heard that um, 80 million people started podcasts and they ended after three episodes. I have gone three seasons. So I withstood the the, the uh, test of time. And my podcast, which is called Heart Forward Conversations from the Heart, is intended to educate lay people like us. I realize that lay people who don't have family members in the system, who don't work in the system, or are not consumers of the system, we're really struggling to understand, like, why are things so messed up? And how is it that I could advocate as a lay person to improve the, the situation. So my podcast is really focused on educating people about how our system works, how the Italian system works, and you know where we can find the synergies um, to, to, to actually try to do something different here in the United States. And then the Radical Hospitality Initiative is something that I had a small grant from PATH initially during the pandemic and it ended, but we've continued this. And what we're doing here is we are going into a couple of places and we're practicing radical hospitality. Like, what does that feel like? What, what, is it, what does it look like? Um, so as I mentioned to you, it's we see you, we hear you, you are safe here, your voice matters. And the kinds of things we've been doing uh, at two PATH facilities in, in Hollywood, um, PATH Villas at Gower and PATH Metro Villas, we have a garden, right? where I get community volunteers who are wonderful, who come in and hang out with the residents. And the the value of the garden is less about whether or not the tomatoes grow, but more about the relationships that are being built. So it goes back to social connection. Um, I will tell people, I really don't need you to volunteer for me unless you can commit a year, because this is really about building relationship. We have cooking classes. We just had one on Saturday uh, that the residents love at Path Metro Villas. Uh, down in Long Beach, we did, um, it was kind of more focused on music, and we have a wonderful volunteer there who has twice brought in the um, Cal State Long Beach uh, String Quartet to do a concert for the residents, and she also provides piano lessons. And then I've been going to Twin Towers, uh, which is LA County's jail, for the last year in what's called the FIP step-down unit, where the most seriously mentally ill um, inmates reside, just to kind of understand how people end up there. And there's some novel in, innovative programs that are going on there to create a more kind environment, which I can't go into right now, but it definitely looks like radical hospitality. So I feel like we're onto something. So what I wanted to do is just, as I kind of bring this to a close and get ready to talk to you all is kind of like focus on one place where we're doing the radical hospitality initiative, which is a board and care home in Hollywood. Board and cares are different than supportive housing. It's where people live with um, serious mental illness and they are in a congregate setting. Um, they the, the meals are provided for them. Their laundry is done. They live two people to a room. They're extremely underfunded and they're falling apart and closing at a fast clip in the state of California. Uh, this particular one is where Tori lived. He lives in a different one right now. 
And so you can see this horrible patch of dirt in the back where the, the residents would sit. So I was able to get a grant to do a community garden there. And um, this was about a year ago. I love this picture. This was um, as we were building the boxes and filling it with dirt and everybody was helping. Um, and there was just great sense of camaraderie and purpose around, around this garden. Um, and then um, I managed to connect with uh, the USC School of Occupational Therapy through kind of a serendipitous introduction. And they asked if they could place uh, student interns at this board and care. Um, and I, I welcomed that. And so we now are finishing up our second tour of USC occupational therapy interns. And you can see just this is their, this awful carport where this is where the, this is where people have they gather. They usually sit out and smoke. And then you can see a little garden is in the back. But with these OT students, there has just been this um building of community, which has been profound. And the the residents love it. And now I just welcome these students every chance I can get because without them, they really have nothing else to do. But so now I want to go into the pet phase. So I realized, oh my gosh, my logo has a has a horse. So there is a pet in my logo. And um, this actually dates back to, and you can go to um, my website where I have a little thing like, why is the horse on the logo? The reason is because in Italy, this horse, Marco Cavallo is the name of the horse, symbolizes freedom from the asylum. And on the large asylum campus in Trieste, they had a horse, Marco Cavallo, who was actually um, pulled the laundry cart, apparently, but, but was beloved by the residents. And when the asylum was like liberated, um, he was liberated also, and but they they let him live on the grounds of the asylum. So everything you see in Trieste pays homage to this horse, including like this big sculpture. And then this here is my kitten from a couple of years ago. And you can see I have two little sculptures of the horse. You can buy them on the grounds of the asylum. So it's ubiquitous. It's like, yes. So that's why I put the horse into my logo. Um, now back to back to the board and care. Um, here's a couple pictures that I had had picked up in Trieste, and I wish I would have gotten more. But two residential communities. This is not the same yellow cat, different yellow cat, but the cats live in the facilities, right? And um, and I was so happy to see them. They were everywhere, and dogs the the psychiatrists would bring their dogs to meetings in the mental health center which was just mind blowing so the the pets were ubiquitous so about 2 weeks ago and i don't know if garetti's on this um she, i know she got a scholarship to attend the um conference today uh she's one of the uh ot students at bel air and she rescued a dog in downtown la and texted me and asked if she could bring the dog with her to uh the day that they're there Tuesdays with the, with the residents and the owner of the board and care said, yes. So here she brought this dog and um, apparently it was just one day was just a transformative experience for so many people. Um, I know all these people, but you can just see the, um, the interest, like, like, like just the attraction that this pet had this particular woman loose you could see was pretty much coveting any opportunity to um, have this dog nearby her. And um, she's a person who has constantly said that one of her goals is to go walking in the neighborhood, but she never does. But she ended up uh, going for a walk in the neighborhood with the dog. <laughs> so um, now um, I was asking my husband, who's kind of a, a management expert, like, what is it about the American system that always has us default to risk adverse strategies. Cause I had asked even the, the head of the board and care, would you be open to letting um, a dog live here? Like as a pilot, like if we could get it through the state licensing board and through the department of mental health, could we do a pilot where a dog could live at this board and care? And right off the bat, she had all the reasons why it wouldn't work. Well, what if the dog bites somebody? Um, what if the dog, what if like the residents agree to take care of the dog and but then they give up and then now I'm taking care of the dog, right? Um, what if the dog is abused? 
so my husband said there's a, there's this theory it's it's called force field analysis de designed by a, a management consultant many years ago Kurt Lewin and anytime you have like a, a problem that you want to try to solve you've got what you would call um driving forces and restraining forces okay so these red forces are the restraining forces these are all the reasons why you can't achieve the blue thing in the middle so it's just something to think about how do we make the driving forces overcome the restraining forces to try to achieve some of these things that i think we would we would find valuable and then the last thing that's just this is <laughs> she said that day everybody was going for a walk with this dog i just love this picture but I'm going to stop sharing now so that we can have a conversation. And I'd love to know and hear ideas from people also about how we can uh, strengthen those driving forces to overcome some of these, ch these challenges we face. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was awesome. It's so inspirational to know that there's alternatives and uh, I think people are gonna have a lot of questions and I already see hands. Um, and hopefully people know to put your questions in the chat, um, in the Q&A, if you haven't already done so. Um, Wanda, I see your hand raised. I, I love this. I actually love this a couple years ago. I'm from York, Pennsylvania um, and I, we, I actually attended a um, presentation where we had a bunch of mental health providers and they were actually talking about a project like this. It never went anywhere like a lot of things, you know, we get presentations all the time. Look at what, what we're going to do. This is great. And then, you know, nothing happens. But I, I love this. Um, I really like the, the little visual you had of this is what could go wrong and this is what this is the alternative to it because I, I'm sitting here laughing about that because my therapist does that with me all the time. She <laughs> always, anything, any negative thought, you challenge it with a positive. Like, oh, I don't, you know, I'm not successful. I haven't done anything in my life. Okay, well then, then, you know, challenge that, put down the opposite. So I like that, but I just, thank you. I think it, that's a great, um, it, it is a great presentation. As a member of the mental health community, I would love to see this come to fruition in more communities. Um, I don't know. I think, I, and I can't speak for anyone else out there, but I'm sure there's others who have similar problems in their communities. If you have leadership that is not really progressive or open-minded, and they're looking more at a bottom line, um, you know, there's trying to bring that that kind of revolutionary concept could be difficult. So I, I think maybe that's the biggest challenge. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Wanda. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything to that, Carrie. I kind of have something to say to that, which is just really quickly that I, I don't know that it's so much about the bottom line as it is about culture and that risk-averse culture that we've sort of been you know, just embed, it's just integrated into how we do things so deeply that it's very difficult to get people out of it. And it's in many different spaces in the equity space and the lived experience space and all of those places we're moving to try to do things differently. But, you know, something that Carrie said, the clinical model has been the you know, overriding sort of principle in all care and services for so long that it's just hard to tease that apart. Yeah. Uh, did, go ahead. Um, Artesia, I do see your hand up, but I want to get to one of the questions in the chat first that came through right away. Um, and I think it does piggyback off of what Wanda's uh, question was. So, and I think this is a question that many people have for you, Carrie. Um, and it just moved. Uh, here it is. Do you believe that the individualistic culture of the USA versus <laughs> the collectivistic culture of Italy may have something to do with the success of uh, the success of Trieste versus the failure of the US to address not just the mental health needs, but human needs of our homeless population? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And and I, I will get people say, well, you know, in Italy, the, their families are so much stronger and blah, blah, blah. 
Yeah, that's true. And I, I always say like, we are not, we, we can't like um, replicate, it, it, you know, Italy and the United States, but we can be inspired by things. So you go back to that. I agree. The ind individualistic culture, it, it kind of uh, uh, walks us away from being in community and being um, social. And we certainly have seen the, the negative impacts of that with the pandemic. But I do believe that people are hungry for those kinds of connections. And we have to find a way to break past that sense that just you're going to go it on your own and buck up and make it happen and, and find those natural ways for the connections. Our system, like to Anne's point, is, is built to not allow those relationships. I'll give you an example. I went, I, I'm in LA County Twin Towers, as you know, and during my orientation to go into the jail, I, I had a three hour orientation with every possible thing that could go wrong, you know, when you work in the jail. And the number one theme was do not fraternize with the inmates. Do not fraternize. They did a video on fraternization. And I'm like, what? So finally, after like hearing this six times, I raised my hand. I said, excuse me, I'm just trying to understand this fraternization thing. Like you're saying, I can't share any personal information. So like, if I want to have like a conversation with an inmate and say, Hey, um, what movie do you like to see? Or what flavor of ice cream do you like? Uh, I can't say that. And, and she looked at me, she goes, well, why would you want to do that? I said, well, maybe to have a conversation, maybe to find some common ground. And, and, and the rule was no fraternization. So I've, I have actually broken that rule a hundred times a day, because how can you be in relationship without sharing a little bit about who you are and, and hearing from them as well? So yeah, it, it's a cultural uh, problem that we've got to push past. Okay, Artesia, I see uh, you've been patiently waiting with your uh, hand. And now, um, Ms. Carey, I applaud you for being part of the community for inmates because that is definitely a community that people overlooked. I am also part of a community where we rehabilitate those who've been formerly incarcerated by providing life skills. And I've noticed that is a skill that, for whatever reason, society fails to participate in. You cannot house nobody or expect anybody to move forward if they're not provided the proper life skills. And I've noticed when I've engaged with certain clients, because I do work with uh, homeless services from LASA, my job is to make sure that all resources are provided for you. But once an inmate has been released, they're not provided with no type of birth certificates, no type of forms on how to navigate just to get back to getting back to society. What you've done is put them in a state of mindset of, okay, how do I fend? What am I going to do? So I'm basically going to go back. So my issue has been, at what point can we make a requirement for those who've been formerly incarcerated when they get out, that they have some type of life skill program that's mandatory for them to take along with us as civilians to make it mandatory for us to engage with them. So we also can hear their story. Yeah, it's, you know, I, from what I understand, and, and I'm not an expert in the criminal justice system, but they do a better job in that coming out of prison, you know, because there's more um, mm -hmm. in, in the state prison system than there is in the county jail system. But I think there is, I think with this new sheriff that has been elected, Sheriff Luna, he is much, you know, more open to um, innovation. And also the, the LA County is under pressure to um, close down Men's Central Jail and find alternative places for people to go. So th there's some avenues. There's the Alternatives to Incarceration Task Force, which you might be aware of. Uh, you, you might uh, Google them to see how you could bring your community voice into that space. And there's also another um, nonprofit I recently was introduced to called um, Amity. I think it's Amity Foundation. And I, they, yeah. I'm so I'm, Have you heard of Second Call? No, no, I'm going to write that's that down. One I, yeah, I, that's one that I think you should really look into. Okay. Their job is really, they believe in jobs and not, I mean, they believe in careers and not jobs. Definitely providing second chances. Yeah, don't give up, Artisha. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
um, I wanted to just also say something about, um, you know, there were so many different things that I heard from all of the folks that I know that went to Trieste. And, but one thing that really, really stuck with me was um, I think Chris Coe telling me something to the effect of, you know, when, when you went to the conference that when he talked to people afterwards um, to ask them what their thoughts were about, you know, what was happening, what was done in Hollywood and blah, 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 that they really couldn't even process it because they couldn't really get over the idea that we actually had people on the streets. Like that was just so beyond their understanding, right? I mean, that just just really, really stuck with me. And just, I don't know if there's a question there. <laughs> no, you know, it, it it's kind of like the picture I showed of the Walk of Fame. And right. I just got to the point where I just could not keep doing my job and walking over people. And it's actually gotten worse. Yeah. Um, so there are days that I feel kind of discouraged, like, oh my gosh, we're, this is such a big thing. That, in fact, I've written blogs about the fact that we actually do not have a mental health system in America. I will just say that we do not have a mental health system because what is a system? A system is something that kind of helps you transport from A, B, C, like think of the transportation system. You get on your street, you get on a freeway on-ramp, you get on the freeway, you get on the off-ramp, you, you, it's a, it's your, it's a, it has a throughway to a destination, your circulation system, your digestive system, the mental health system is broken at every juncture. There is no system. So for us to keep investing money into a non-system is a non-starter. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be, um, you know, speaking to our, our Tisha's point, we have to stay indignant. We cannot get numb to the fact that it is okay to walk over people on the Hollywood Walk of Fame or any street in your city. It's absolutely unacceptable. And as you know, the, the family members who are fighting this fight because their loved ones have schizophrenia or bipolar or been hospitalized or jailed or whatever, they need our help. So we as lay people have to harness our indignation to help turn this into a movement. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you, Carrie. I have a couple more questions for you in our Whova chat. So a lot of it has to do with um, we're sort of interconnected, even though the questions are coming from different people. It's around liability. And um, that is a huge issue in our movement to have services accept people and their animals together. Like I would say it's the number, it's probably the number one concern. If it's not number one, it's really high up there. Um, they're just concerned that they're going to, that a dog's going to bite somebody or something like that. Um, so the question is, how do you overcome the overwhelming concerns about liability that are often the biggest restraining forces in mental health and often lead to actions and structures that take people's dignity away? Yeah, that is the absolute right question. And I think to the Going back to my slide on the restraining forces and the driving forces, one thing we all can try to do when we're trying to do system change is to suggest pilots, right? Pilots are, are kind of like um, palatable. So I'm I'm thinking like this board and care, and I see Goretti is on on the um on the call. Someone needs to get their PhD thesis to look at the outcomes that could be measured of 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 well-being, recovery, and, uh, and and less violent behavior in the board and care, because instead of like going and punching out a plate glass window, someone could sit down and pet the dog, for example, or, or stroke the cat. And so if there could start to be some um, evidence that would show that the presence of pets it actually has these positive impacts, we could start to maybe push past the liability factors. And maybe that research has started. Again, I'm new to this space and I'd be really interested to know. I, I know that I did ask my friends at LA County Jail, like, would you guys be interested in having a dog in your pod? And there is apparently a, 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 a nonprofit that comes through with a dog and they can pet the dog, but it's like, that's not enough. And um, 
and, the, and he was like, Abs- this is one of the inmates who, who kind of has a, a leadership role in this pod. He goes, absolutely, that would be transformative. So I think we need to push for some pilots um, to try to push past this risk aversion mentality. Ah, thank you. Go ahead, Ann. I just wanted to, this is just kind of a tangent, but I, and you, you'll know if this is right or not, or maybe I'm conflating things, Christine, but I remember reading an article a couple of years ago when they, before we were ready to shut down Rikers, that uh, they were, they brought in um, cats, right? Because of like, as a side thing, because of, you know, the rodent problem, Mm -hmm. but they ended up sort of becoming this great comfort and, and community centric, um, you know, uh, social thing for the inmates that, you know, was an accident. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to look into that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. There's definitely a whole like thing about Rikers Island and the cats, which I won't get into, but, um, (laughs) Yes, like the the research on animal assisted therapy, animal assisted interventions is there. And like the clinical people have been doing a really good job, um, especially recently with some of the the hard science stuff, like swabbing the inside of people's mouths after they've stroked a dog to see that Mm. the stress levels go down. And so all of that is there, but I think that, you know, there could always be more of it, but um, like the, the practice research divide like it's just it just mm-hmm. seems like the practice field it takes a long time for them to catch on with what's actually being emerging in the research um but also I want to say I love your story about the boarding care and the OT intern because like I feel like I've been that in I'm not an OT but I've been that intern where I've been at um like a transitional housing facility and people use that outdoor space to smoke and to drink coffee And the goal is to have them sort of walk once around the block, maybe once a week even. And that seems very attainable for for me, Um, but it's very difficult for people to go ahead and do that. It's so hard uh, to break habits and to hear that the dog, the dog that came in really helped them advance on that goal. Like that's just a beautiful thing. And I actually had an idea uh, because the owner was like reticent. Well, what if no one wanted to take the dog and then I get saddled with the dog? What if, what if we created like a little doggy daycare business there, you know, for three dogs and, and, you know, you drop your dog off that day and look, you're going to, that dog's going to get all sorts of love, get a bunch of walks. You can pick up that dog at the end of the day. Like that's where my mind is going right now. And I'm not going to stop thinking about it. We got to try some new stuff here. Yes. Well, I, there. I mean, I don't know if other. Or do we have other questions, Christine? In the we do. We do. Okay. Go ahead. But, I'm not going to take this time. <laughs> I have so much to say. <laughs> well, this is um, this is the last question, and then Anne, you and Carrie can chat to close us out. But um, <laughs> people are very interested in pilots. You know, as you mentioned, pilots seem to be the way to go to at least get the foot in the door. So what was the budget for the pilot approved before the pandemic pivot? Yeah, so the, the pilot is still in place, although it has been modified somewhat. It's a, it's still $116 million. And the LA County Department of Mental Health is ramping up to get this started with, with a great deal of community input. Some of the kind of um, Oh, payment reform features of the pilot are no, are no longer included, which are kind of technical details. But um, it does imagine a whole host of community touch points, including a mental health clubhouse, um, some kinds of facilities that we don't have right now in Hollywood, such as a psychiatric urgent care, peer respite, use use of peers in a lot of spaces because peers can be quite impactful for people. Um, Some kind of like shifting away from a clinical presence to a people with lived experience. Um, And then jobs and vocational training for people um, and and mapping of what we would call community assets, cultural institutions, educational institutions, so that these these, uh, connection points are are created into an ecosystem in Hollywood that doesn't exist right now. So I'm actively involved in helping to um, 
prepare and plan for this. And there will be some, some new facilities that will come alongside it, some new programs. So it's back. You can actually um, Google Hollywood 2.0 or Hollywood Forward. Um, and uh, Forward is uh, for WRD. That stands for four walls, a roof, and a door, but for Hollywood Forward um, to keep up with the program. Amazing. I don't know if people can hear my um, geriatric cat in the background yelling, but he managed to push open the, the closed door to come in and yell at me <laughs> for not paying attention. So, um, I, I mean, I, w I really do wish that we could talk forever. And Carrie, we are going to, it's been too long. There's so much to talk about, but I'm so um, just grateful that that all of this has come together. There's so many, I mean, I know that I am an animal lover and I always have been an animal lover and I do not, there, there, there never ceases to be intersections where I see the opportunities and the possibilities of how healing our relationships with the animal world, with nature, all of those things are not being, you know, leveraged and, and people need, you know, people need healing. And there's a lot of healing that needs to be done in our communities. And we've been doing it in a way that is, you know, it's no longer, it's no longer working. Um, Again, I, I credit you with when you and I met when you were at the Fernwood shelter behind Home Depot in Hollywood, and you brought that first Petco kennel. I and I remember that was radical. That it was, was a, radical. It was radical because that was keeping people from being agreeing to come into the shelter. And um, and you know, you'd show up there and you'd hear the happy barking of dogs. And yeah, <laughs> kudos to you for being Thanks. an innovator yeah. in that space. Yeah, and now you know path that that's their their you know they don't that's not there anymore but they you know are pro you know pets and pets come in and all of that so you know it's a it's a process it feels like uh it's a process but we have some ways to go but thanks Carrie thank you so much for being here and doing this and everything that you've done um and opening I hope a lot of hearts and minds I believe and uh, we thanks, will thanks definitely. For, yeah, thanks for inviting me. And anybody who's got ideas that you want to share with me about um, how little mini pilots have helped to make a difference in this space, just reach out to me on the on the Wova app or you know via my contact information. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you, guys. Fantastic.